better be ready because we're going to get it on. Mike Semper VV here with you for the next hour talking professional wrestling, which is something we do every single day here on the Sports Byline Broadcasting Network. Tune in iHeart, American Forces Radio, sportsbyline.com, over-the-air affiliates like the Mighty Year 1090, Sirius XM 156, via podcast or streaming video on Twitch and on YouTube. However you're joining me today, I'd just like to say thank you. As always, there is a lot to get into. Some of it even has to do with the action that takes place inside of a wrestling ring. Although it's the other aspect of what we do that seems to be titillating the passionate juices of your wrestling souls. You know, traditionally when we've heard about drama at this time of year coming out of Jacksonville, it's usually got something to do with something with the Jaguars. But no, this time around it's the Jacksonville Wrestling Office. All Elite Wrestling is allegedly, supposedly, reportedly having gallons of spicy tea being spilled all over the place, including allegedly, supposedly, reportedly, right in all of our faces on Wednesday night's program with CM Punk's promo about Hangman Page. And I have thoughts on this whole situation playing out at a time where, will you look at that, MJF is allegedly, supposedly, reportedly on the way back. So we'll get into that as well as SmackDown. And I'll give you the very detailed WWE.com preview for tonight's show on the Fox Network, as well as some news from around the world, including Kyrie being pulled from an upcoming big match in stardom. And some of my thoughts on the recently concluded G1 Climax tournament from New Japan Pro Wrestling. I thought it actually ended pretty darn good, although... Still not sold on this concept, but we'll get into all of that stuff and more when we get back from break. Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Semper VB here with you, Wrestling Observer Live. You're listening to this show live right now, and you're traveling around, and you're a sports fan, and you always have sports byline on in the car, and you're wondering what in the world is going on. I'm trying to get updates on what in the world is happening in Major League Baseball. Don't worry, we got you covered. The Chicago Cubs right now leading the Milwaukee Brewers 4-2. So there you go. There's that. Everything else is a night game tonight. So we'll, we'll keep you updated on that as as the day goes on, if I have any time for it here, because, oh boy, there's wrestling news. Right now I'm sending mental telepathy to DJ Convoy, my good friend who uh, does the write-ups for these shows and is going through a series of crises here, uh, crises, uh, whatever, uh, in recent times having to deal with people online and in forums and such. And boy, I'll just get right to it. Maxwell Jacob Friedman is expected to return to AEW in the near future. And you can read about this up at the main page of WrestlingObserver.com. MJF has been gone from the company since he appeared on the June 1st edition of AEW Dynamite and cut a promo imploring Tony Khan to fire him. But with TV rights fees negotiations soon likely to begin in a few months, he is scheduled to return, quote, somewhat soon. The situation was addressed by Dave Meltzer in Friday's edition of the Wrestling Observer Newsletter. He says MJF is currently scheduled to be returning somewhat soon. We don't know the exact time, but the negotiations for a new TV deal will likely be taking place starting in just a few months and into the spring. So the TV ratings numbers, probably September to whenever the deal is closed are the most important to date so this recent drop is the worst time to have a drop Meltzer says referring to the AEW ratings recently and I'm sure that means both Dynamite and Rampage which has been suffering very very badly the story goes on to say that AEW has not mentioned MJF during his absence from the company Shortly after his promo on June 1st, there was an edict issued to remove him from AEW promotional spots and commercials. Everyone remembers that, right? That All that stuff? If not, this is what The Observer reported back then. MJF is currently being edited out of any TBS and TNT spots he appears in with different AEW footage replacing him. 
We are told that the existing spots with MJF have officially been pulled, but it's possible some more still may pop up as they transition to newer spots. And that was Wrestling Observer uh, talking about a PW Insider story. MJF, of course, no show to meet and greet during AEW Double or Nothing weekend. And he wrestled at the pay-per-view, but did a... A incredible job to Wardlow where he lost via 10 power bombs and then had oxygen applied to his forehead as he was carted out of the building. The next night he cut a, a promo uh, speaking about his unhappiness with everything in AEW and called uh, Tony Khan a <clears throat> blank mark before his microphone was cut off and AEW then pulled down all MJF's merch and removed him from the roster page, and they didn't upload that clip to YouTube because they really wanted to sell the drama of the whole thing, but you know what is up on AEW's YouTube channel for its 3.3 million subscribers? The full show opening CM Punk promo from this past Wednesday night, and as of... 3 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, there were nearly 380,000 people who have clicked on it. During Thursday morning's Wrestling Observer Radio, Dave Meltzer said that promo that was cut by CM Punk was, quote, weird for everyone, as in nobody knew he was going to do that. On yesterday's Observer Live, you heard Brian echo what Dave said and give his, his thoughts on it. And I asked him if this was an issue that predated CM Punk and his time in AEW and was an old piece of baggage that was dragged in. And he pointed to Hangman Page's promo from Before Double or Nothing, where he talked about Punk putting a fake face and on in the public and really being a locker room cancer and what all he was intimating from that. And all that time later after that promo, with only two weeks to go before the pay-per-view for which there was and is no main event announced at a time where there's no reason really to dignify whatever it was Paige said that really upset him, according to Dave, there is no plan to make that match in the near future. Certainly not for All Out 2, but CM Punk, hijacked his own promo because he had to get his receipt back. A promo that AEW immediately, on the night that it happened, tweeted out with a post that read, did CM Punk just challenge former AEW world champion Hangman Page to a rematch here in West Virginia? AEW is live on TBS. Okay. On the go-home show for Double or Nothing, Paige cut a promo right in Punk's face about defending all elite wrestling from him. That's exactly what he said, in fact. Remember that? And, and people were speculating about why Hangman was seemingly acting out of character and being all fired up against another baby face. And Punk responded to him by asking him why he was speaking in riddles and why he was so fired up. And then they, they go out and have a really good wrestling match. And from what I remember, Punk run the, won the title. That's what happened there. And now there's people trying to piece all of this stuff together who are reading and hearing about all this sort of stuff. And it's, did CM Punk really threaten to walk out at some point? Is this just punk being punk again and being moody and surly and tough to deal with? And that's some of the nicer ways that I can describe him on national commercial radio. Is it about how he treats other people, how he treats people that he perceives to be lesser than him all while putting on a, a fake public persona? Is it about Colt Cabana? Dave, in the newest edition of the Wrestling Observer Newsletter, writes, Right now there's a ton of backstage drama involving many of the top guys that has gotten much worse in recent weeks. The big thing that started all of this is that Colt Cabana is not in the dark order with no angle and stopped being brought to television. He was going to be cut, but Khan signed him for ROH. That is really the catalyst of everything, although different people have different stories as to why it happened, including Page and Punk. But even if that didn't happen, it was 
probably going to happen for something else. Just given the nature of the different personalities involved, it feels like a number of people are close to their breaking point if things don't get settled. End quote. And Brian mentioned on yesterday's shows that people are said to be furious on both sides of the locker room. And it has been bandied about that if you're, say, on Punk's mythical side of the locker room, what does Paige have to complain about? If it's about Cabana, he's signed to ROH. What was he contributing to the Dark Order anyway, week in and week out? Was it also Punk's fault that Stu Grayson and Alan Angels were not re-signed or that Anna Jay was turned or that they're just a group of dudes on the roster? He signed last September, and you're still doing this now. So on that side of the ledger, they're asking if it's Hangman Page that's being a full diaper baby about this whole thing. And frankly, to me... A full diaper is a really good metaphor here because something definitely stinks. And because this is a lot of he shit said and she said stuff, mostly he said, it's a bunch of dudes, something is amiss here. I'm not buying into the fact wholeheartedly that this thing does not have some... K-Fabulous flair put on it. I cannot believe if CM Punk went out there and did this and was able to cut this receipt. And in that case, if there is not some wrestling that is a part of this whole thing and layered in here, then you better kind of fix your shop and figure some things out because dude's been there for a year. And if you got guys going at it like this for the most petty reasons and using your TV time to do it, you got a lot of work to do. We'll be back, Wrestling Observer Live. Back on the show, Mike Sempervivi here with you, Wrestling Observer Live. You know, we do this show right here for an hour at a time every single day, except for Andrew Zarian, who on Sundays does this show for two hours from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. But if you want any of us 24-7, you can find all of us on Twitter, I am at Semper Vivi. The timeline for this show is at W-O-N-F-4-W. The broadcaster is at Sports Byline USA. And if you love pro wrestling, at Mid-Atlantic Pod. With everything I talked about in the first segment of this show, that is a nice way to go back and refresh yourself with just pro wrestling from 1933 to 1988. Unfortunately, I don't have many clips of video from 1933, uh, most of them from Dusty Rhodes' era in the 80s. But you know what? That's a pretty damn good era for wrestling to go back and watch and get some ideas about. And Man, you know, we needed a substitution at a large level for WWE. Everybody needs a little bit of competition out there to some level to to test their medals against and that's what we wanted AEW to be at least a lot of us you know be that WCW type of option just don't do all of the things that WCW did and there's a lot of what AEW does that harkens back wonderfully to the times where WCW especially on Nitro did things right <laughs> all of this work shoot stuff and whether this is a work or a shoot it doesn't matter. Then it's a lack of institutional control where CM Punk feels as though he's got to, to go out and do that. And you're at a point where you have active talent as senior vice presidents that are having to deal with all of this stuff. And, and look, we mentioned yesterday on the show that they have put layers into place. Tony Schiavone uh, has talked about it in an interview about helping out backstage, about going around to people, talking to them, getting some feedback from them, making sure that people just don't build up a bunch of pressure, making sure that there are some release valves for some of this steam before it hits a, a, a ridiculous level. But if this is about Colt Cabana, and I feel... Because I really like Cole Cabana. I like him personally. I have no animus about Cole Cabana whatsoever. And I feel bad that he's in this situation and in this whole deal here. Because if this is about him, 
You signed Punk a year ago, and these aren't wounds, obviously, that are going to close, or at least they're not going to close anytime soon, and any open wounds you have back there could get infected and infect others, and that sounds like that's what the case is right now, and something has got to be fixed. Something has got to be figured out. Because after a week of wrestling that we just had, Almost across the board. I mean, the New Japan shows, and I'll get into that a little bit later on. I mean, they were excellent shows this week to lead into the finals. Raw, when you place it against, look, I know there's somebody out there that is going to be upset about this, but place Raw against Raw standards, especially recently. I thought that was an easy show to watch. I thought NXT was an easy show to watch. You give me matches like Giovanni Vinci and Carmelo Hayes and tell me that these two guys could be part of the future of WWE. I can't say anything bad about a show like that. You go into Dynamite, look how, especially how it was bookended. I thought it was tremendous. That first hour of that show was was certainly something else. So, you know, you have a good week of wrestling here, and what happens at the end of it two weeks before your pay-per-view? We're talking about things that may not even matter. You know, and if it does matter because this is all being a work shoot, is this really what you want to do? Is this really what you want to do coming off the MJF thing? Is is this what... Yeah. Hey, they're bigger brains than, than I have. They're... They've got the the company. We'll see what they do. As of right now, as of right now, this is the card for All Out 2. Thunder Rosa against Tony Storm for the AEW women's title. Wardlow and FTR against Jay Lethal and Sanjay Dutt and Satnam Singh. And, excuse me, this is how this was written up here. My apologies. Wardlow and FTR against Jay Lethal, Sanjay Dutt and Satnam Singh. Eddie Kingston against Sammy Guevara. So that is what is scheduled currently for the show. It also appears uh, the House of Black against Sting, Darby Allen, and Miro is going to be one of those matches. Jade Cargill against Athena for the TBS title. Jungle Boy and Christian Cage. Brian Danielson and Chris Jericho. And Ricky Starks against Powerhouse Hobbs. All look like matches that are going to be added to that show. No swerve in our glory in the, in, in the AEW World Tag Team Championships. Although, no spoilers here, they may not be champions by the time that show rolls around. But if that show does happen to roll around and Swerve in Our Glory does defeat Private Party tonight on the pre-taped Rampage episode, I would assume that you would see that match in a pre-show uh, forum. Uh, also tonight on Rampage, with all of this stuff that we've talked about this week with AEW, um, unlike what is happening with WWE outside the ring, I don't know if that uh, is going to be necessarily that beneficial for Rampage tonight, but the best friends face off against the Trust Busters in the AEW Trios title tournament. And if everything uh, goes like it did last week, the Trust Busters will be the cause of a big increase in AEW Rampage programming ratings. At least that's what I was uh, told online. Also tonight, the FDW title hook against Zach Clayton, who... Is Jay Wow from Jersey Shore's boyfriend? I think. He cut a good promo. They had a nice little video package of him on Dynamite on Wednesday, and I heard his promo last week on Rampage. I still really don't know who this dude is, but apparently he is a functional professional wrestler that will be facing off against Hook tonight. Athena will face the returning Penelope Ford, as well as Buddy Matthews facing off against Serpentico. So that is going to be Rampage for tonight. There is a little bit of positive AEW news as I remember that there's a Red Bull right over here for you ASMR kids. There we go. RDS, which is the French language leading sports television station in Quebec, has announced that Dynamite will join their lineup as of August 24th, and it will be live. It will stream live on their website every week, and that is important because it will air on RDS and RDS2 in Quebec, but we are going into NHL season, and I know there's a few people in the province that are not fans of the Habs, but the Montreal Canadiens will be playing hockey here very, very shortly, and go figure... That takes precedence. So this is a, a station, though, 
that has got no fear of professional wrestling. They've carried WWF and WCW in the past. They've carried Ring of Honor recently, TNA, uh, IWS. So they are a pro wrestling supporter. And this is going to be the first time Dave writes in the observer, uh, since Eddie Quinn's wrestling in Quebec in the 1950s on channel two, that a regular television station will air live pro wrestling in French in in Quebec as WWF and all the other promotions that have aired on the station as well as the territorial groups like All Star and International Wrestling Grand Prix all of those shows were taped shows so there's at least a little bit of a feather in, in Dynamite's cap for this week speaking of Montreal here is WWE's very expansive preview for tonight's show emanating, I would assume, from the Bell Center in Montreal. Roman Reigns and Drew McIntyre go head-to-head, -head, which as phrases go, I don't think is correct because they're actually going to be going face-to-face in a battle of words with a microphone. I, I believe that's what it is, but uh, they're saying head-to-head -head maybe to try to fool people here, but this is what it reads. Just weeks before their battle at WWE Clash at the Castle for the undisputed WWE Universal Championship, the head of the table and the Scottish Warrior will go head-to-head -head on SmackDown. The last time Roman Reigns tried to address his future opponent, Drew McIntyre was blindsided by a returning carry-on cross. Cross, along with the returning Scarlet, laid an hourglass at the feet of Reigns, indicating the end was near. With only weeks to go until their showdown at the premium live event in Cardiff, Wales, what will Reigns and McIntyre say to each other? Plus, will Cross make his presence felt after shocking the WWE Universe? Find out tonight on SmackDown, 8 p.m. 7 Central on Fox. That's it. That's the only thing that's up there right now, and it is uh, as we are live here for this edition of the show, 3.35 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. What is not being advertised? Nikita Lyons and Zoe Stark against Natalia and Sonya Deville in the WWE Women's Tag Team Title Tournament qualifying quarterfinal match, whatever it is. Nikita Lyons has tweeted about it earlier on today about what she was going to do alongside her partner Zoe Stark, but... Toxic Attraction is in Canada. I can confirm this. I've heard they were at a Tim Hortons. Fightful Select has reported this. Uh, I believe Mike Johnson has reported this, and I know there are people uh, on this website as well that had gotten texts yesterday and today stating that Toxic Attraction was going to take the place of Nikita Lyons and uh, Zoe Stark in that match. Not sure the... Condition of Zoe Stark right now, or they're, how they're going to handle this with Nikita Lyons, uh, whether they mention that Zoe is out or not and mention why, uh, we'll have to see if they do a angle where they lay both of them out or something like that. I guess that is possible as well, too. But Toxic Attraction will take on Natalia and Sonia Deville, so Brian Alvarez can be happy about that as he drives his family home from the beach. I also believe that the uh, Viking Raiders are going to hold some sort of Viking funeral for the New Day as well, too, which I assume will bring back Xavier Woods, but we'll have to see. We'll be back on the show, Wrestling Observer Live. Back on the show, Mike Sempervivi here with you, Wrestling Observer Live. If you're listening to me on Saturday, that is because Jim Valley is out and about, but he will be back here in this chair very, very soon. Saturday's Wrestling Observer Live comes on 1 p.m. Eastern Time, 10 a.m. Pacific, and on Sundays, 6 p.m. Eastern Time, 3 p.m. Pacific with Andrew Zarian. The big boss man, Brian Alvarez, will be back in this main chair coming up on Monday, 3 p.m. Eastern time, as we always do. If you're listening to me live right now, pitching need not apply at Wrigley Field. Right now, the Brewers on top of the Chicago Cubs, 5-4 to four in the top of the fourth. There's plenty of other wrestling news we need to get into today that's got nothing to do with the high drama taking place in AEW. Uh, it, it's got high drama in, in stardom because of high fevers, unfortunately. And, and Kari Sane, uh, the former 
Kari Sane, Kari Hojo, now just Kyrie in all caps, revealed that she has a positive COVID-19 test. She posted it up on Twitter Wednesday night. She's got a fever, and she will be missing the stardom show, which is going to be taking place, the pay-per-view that is going to be taking place coming up, I believe it is on Sunday. Uh, it was going to be she and Saya Kamiatani for the Wonder of Stardom Championship. Instead, that title will be defended against Himeka, Himeka, which is really, that's going to be a very good match as well. And if there is a silver lining in this cloud, it is that they have this match that they can still go to in the future. But very disappointing for Stardom fans like my friend Adam Summers here that was really, really, Really looking forward to that match, and I recently did a big audio nightmare with him. In fact, if you're listening on Friday, we recorded it this morning. It is up for everyone. You don't have to be a subscriber to WrestlingObserver.com to listen to the Adam and Mike Big Audio Nightmare. You can find it wherever you find your favorite podcast and, and give it a download, and we talk uh, a little bit about stardom, but a lot about the G1 Climax and what we thought of the whole deal. And I got to be honest, since we didn't speak much uh, about it here on Observer Live here in the last couple of days, other than the result of Kazuchika Okada winning, you know, I know Brian has been tired of a lot of things. Of course, he, we don't have the same things that you know gato bothers me in some ways and doesn't bother brian and others but there's some things that gato has done as a part of his booking that has driven brian nuts and one of the things that i know has driven brian nuts is seeing some of the same matchups over and over again and seeing some of the same winners of tournaments and of title belts and He's not the only one, and there were some people that were really kind of frustrated over the fact that Kazuchika Okada won this tournament. But as Adam and I talk about on the show today, remember how he won last year's tournament. It was due to an injury with Kota Ibushi. It was very unsatisfying. And in the preview, in the lead-up to the tournament... I honestly thought we could see a scenario where Will Ospreay was the one that defeated Kazuchika Okada in the finals, and that's what I predicted. But as soon as I saw that match kick in, I knew exactly uh, what they were going to do and how it was going to go, and it was going to be Okada standing there on top of the mountain. Even with everything that Osprey said about figuring out a way to beat him cleanly and, and promising to get the victory over Okada on the 50th anniversary of New Japan Pro Wrestling, you know what? There was no other way, and it was an excellent match, and one day Will Ospreay is going to get that big, clean victory over Kazuchika Okada, and it is going to be on a large stage, and it is probably going to be for the IWGP World Heavyweight Championship, but it was not going to be during the finals of the G1 Climax and the story they told with Okada and how he sold his injuries from the previous nights, the semifinal against Tamatanga that he went into beaten up and destroyed from because he had to face off against Lance Archer and to make sure that he got his spot in the semifinals. The story that was told over those several days with Okada, I thought was excellent. The structure of the tournament I'm still not sold on as far as it being a yearly thing. I give them credit. This year was going to be the year if you were going to do something drastically different with the G1. I thought this was as good of a time as any. But I don't believe that seven men in four blocks over 28 having 28 men and having that spread out for over a month and have shows where there are times only four of seven or eight matches are G1 contests, that's something that I think would desperately need to be tweaked if you want to go to a format where you're going to have four. We talk about it on the show. I just can't see a scenario where two blocks, whether it be eight or 10 or 12 or however many people that you want to have in each block, I think that's really the best way to go, and I think limiting it to about 10 men a block, limiting it to 20, I think is the way to do things. 
it leaves you a more concentrated group. It makes it a little bit easier, at least for somebody like me to keep up with. But maybe I'm too traditionalist. Uh, maybe uh, a lot of people, uh, when they find out the results and everything shakes out, what people have thought about the whole thing, maybe they loved it in Japan. But for me, I think this is one of those cases where I applaud the effort to go and try to change it. But I just don't think it really worked, and it certainly didn't work in early on in this tournament where you had guys that weren't having G1 matches and having singles matches that felt like forever. Adam mentioned Sonata on the program today. I think he was a good example of that. When it comes to who stood out, we were looking at a handful of names going into the thing. Aaron Hanari was had to see where he was going to stand out, one of Will Ospreay's newest members in the United Empire and one of the people on the come up for New Japan Pro Wrestling. El Fantasmo, another one, member of the Bullet Club, switching from the junior heavyweight division to the heavyweight division. We had uh, David Finley. You know, there were a lot of eyes on him, as well as Block A, which had Jonah, Jeff Cobb, and, of course, our own filthy Tom Lawler. And every single person that I just mentioned there across the board, I think, certainly held up their end of the bargain and, and even more so. So they were really, you know, when you look at the entire roster of the G1, there were a lot of names. We knew exactly what they were going to do. We maybe didn't know how many wins they were going to have or uh, how many losses, but we figured a Tamatonga was going to do incredibly well because of the G.O.D. split with the Bullet Club that hasn't been really cinched up yet. And we knew a revitalized Juice Robinson was going to get a lot of attention, and we knew how some of the guys were going to do, but there were a handful of names there. We had to see, look, how much did they want to invest into Jonah over there? And we found out that it was a pretty damn good deal of it because Jonah can claim coming out of the whole deal he was never pinned. He was never flat on his back taking a loss in the G1, and we were able to get some good stories, I think, coming out of that show. Tanahashi and Carl Anderson and these these more recent shows, I should say. Tanahashi, Carl Anderson for the Never title. Kushida and Taiji Ishimori for the Junior Heavyweight Championship. We have Tama Tonga, who got a victory over Jay White. He teamed up on the finals night alongside Kushida to face off against Ishimori and White, the two singles champions. And Ishimori takes the loss. Jado grabbed the belt, handed it over to Kushida. So we'll have to see how that goes, but that's a match that on paper is going to be excellent between two longtime generational rivals in Kushida and Ishimori. We have several opponents set up for Jay White, not the least of which, of course, is Okada. That is going to take place on January 4th, but we have Tamatanga. We have other names that are in the mix. We have the U.S. title situation still, I think, between Will Ospreay and Juice Robinson that needs to get settled. We have still more with El Fantasmo and Shingo, which... You want to talk about a mid-card match and a mid-card feud? And I'm not talking about the talent levels of these men because they're certainly much higher than mid-card, but you really can't go wrong when you're having a feud between El Fantasmo and Shingo that is going to take, you know, on a 10-match card, it's going to be number five right there in the middle, and there is nothing to complain about there. Once all this stuff is settled, too, with what takes place, I guess, with Wardlow and FTR, and I would assume an ROH tag team title match is going to be taking place with Jay Lethal and, and Satnam Singh and FTR at some point, you know, at some point here, I'd like to see FTR go over to Japan and defend those IWGP World Tag Team Championships. They can certainly do it here on New Japan Strong Shows. Maybe that's all they're going to do, but it, that's something that I would like to see, and I would be very, very surprised if FTR wouldn't be pushing for that as well. Where do they not want to go overseas to? NXT UK, which is unfortunately going to be no more. Uh, PW Insider uh, yesterday listed the several names, which included Trent Seven and Zaya Brookside uh, amongst them. Other people started to tweet out 
their statuses with the company. As of right now, here is the list of people that have been cut. Amir Jordan, Danny Luna, Dave Mastiff, Amelia McKenzie, Primate, Nina Samuels, Rohan Raha, Shah Samuels, Sid Scala, Trent Seven, Ashton Smith, Jack Stars, T-Bone, Teoman, Flash Morgan Webster, Wild Boar, Kenny Williams, Amale, Mark Andrews, Zaya Brookside, Eddie Dennis, Saxton Huxley, and Sam Gradwell, all of which are going to be now looking for work NXT Europe is supposedly kicking in where NXT UK will be absorbed into what does this mean for Tyler Bate and B Priestley who is Blair Davenport on the NXT UK roster Gallus they have all appeared including JD McDonough and uh, several others have come over uh, to NXT proper is that a permanent deal? We'll have to see. Who knows? Interesting to see what they do with NXT Europe and if they make it a top-heavy traveling group where you bring over, like they've brought over Chase U to appear on TV. Do they bring over maybe names that aren't doing anything on the main roster, like a Robert Roode, and you bring over some names that are on NXT on the top of the heap right now, and then you fill out that with other people that you may be looking at from the European market and want to give tryouts to or want to take a look at. Who knows? It's going to be really, really interesting. But it's hard for me to believe that there's not going to be something that exists in some form that is European-based, Just because of TV and where that base ends up being, whether it's in Germany or or wherever it happens to be, it's hard for me to believe that they're not going to have a European television show that is going to want to feature some talent. uh, Because otherwise, just shut the whole thing down completely and only send over people from the main roster that uh, will will get people all, all sorts of jacked up and... Hopefully you're all jacked up to watch Rampage tonight. Uh, Dynamite did 957,000 viewers, which was down 1.5% from last week. Second lowest viewership for the show since July 20th. 18 to 49 demo. Dynamite finished second on the cable charts with a .30 rating, about 391,000 people. Down 9% from last week. Second lowest rating in that category since the show moved to T. BS. Those problems also worked its way up into Canada, where John Pollock at Post Wrestling reported that 61,000 viewers and approximately 30,000 in their key 25 to 54 demo saw the show on TSN2, lowest audience of the year. We'll be back to put a bow on everything when we get back from break. Wrestling Observer Live. Back on the show, Mike Semper BB here with you, Wrestling Observer Live. The big boss man, Brian Alvarez, will be back with me on Monday afternoon. Until then, if you need anything, and I mean anything, that there's need to know about in professional wrestling or in mixed martial arts, WrestlingObserver.com is the place to go for that. There's going to be multiple audio shows up over the weekend, not the least of which is Dave Meltzer and Garrett Gonzalez tonight. That show will be posted up at some point, I would say, uh, around 1, 2 o'clock in the morning, uh, probably Saturday morning, uh, Eastern time. Right about then is when that show is going to be up, but they are definitely going to get one done. And like I mentioned, if there's anything that takes place in professional wrestling over the next couple of days, WrestlingObserver.com is going to be your place to go to. Unfortunately, Tegan Knox still has no place to go to. She was on a podcast recently stating that because of visa and green card issues, she is still unfortunately shut out from the professional wrestling scene. She has had so many injuries, but I still continue to believe if she can actually be held together with enough duct tape, with the exception of Joe Calzaghe, to people in North America, she could be the biggest athlete to ever come out of Wales. And I know there's somebody there going, we have this rugby player, we have this football player, we have this, we have that. No. With the exception of Joe Calzaghe, Nixon Newell, Tegan Knox, 
whatever her name is going to be when she's back out there wrestling again, she still has got the opportunity to be the the shiny wizard herself, uh, the biggest export that Wales has ever given us from an athletic point of view. So <laughs> there's that. Hopefully she's trademarking everything in the same way Gunter is as well, too. He has filed the trademark for ring general when it comes to professional wrestling, and there's no better person to have that, whether he, he did it as Gunter or whether he did it as Walter. Uh, I really don't know, but I tell you what, I ain't going to fight him for it. I just like to salute. I don't know if it was John or Jared today in the production box on video, but I salute them. I salute producer Daniel, and I salute you for spending time with me today. We'll talk to you again after a while.